CataractCoach.com, Podcast 38 with Muhammad Sayed. Today's podcast features our guest, Dr. Muhammad Sayed. He is a great surgeon, very talented. And we first saw his video on Cataract Coach way back when, video number 665, about four years ago. And in that video, he decided to get the flexible foot plate of an Ahmed glaucoma seton valve device folded in half and then make a tiny pyridomy. So instead of making a large three clock hour pyridomy, he made a very small pyridomy and folded the implant in half, put it in the pocket, and sutured it in the pocket. I thought it was brilliant, and you should watch that video. Again, it's 665. I've since watched him do other cases, very interesting cases, complicated cases, challenging cases, difficult cases, and he's truly a magnificent surgeon. But then when I got to know him, I was even more impressed. And what I like so much about him is his drive and determination and hard work. Imagine, he's growing up and he goes to medical school and doesn't even know where or what he's going to do. He gets a residency program by some stroke of luck, but mostly by hard work. And then he decides he wants to become an ophthalmologist trained in the U.S. And what's the best program in the U.S. year after year for in terms of rankings? The Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami. So he comes, does a research fellowship, another research fellowship. He wants to do cataract anterior segment glaucoma, but the opportunity initially is oculoplastics. So he does that, but he incorporates some thinking into that. So he does research with a glaucoma agent, prostaglandins, and see how they affect orbital volume, orbital fat loss. Smart. He parlays that into the pediatric fellowship. And during the pediatric fellowship, he begins specializing more in pediatric glaucomas. Then he does a glaucoma fellowship. An incredible amount of training. He's such an amazing young doctor that Baskin Palmer Institute asked him to join his faculty. So he joined his faculty there. Imagine, he's in his home, halfway across the planet, finished med school years ago, and did he ever imagine to be faculty at the Baskin Palmer Institute? He does that for a while. He does private practice in Miami. Then he decides he wants to be involved with more fields. Probably the number one name in ophthalmology in the UK, and they have a branch in the United Arab Emirates. And he decides he's going to move there. And he becomes a very successful ophthalmologist there. So it's an amazing story. If you are a big dreamer in some remote part of the world, and you have these high hopes, all you need is the drive and determination of hard work, and you too can achieve just like Mohammed Syed. Check out the podcast. I think you'll really enjoy it. He's such a wonderful guy. We filmed this in person. I visited him at his home in Dubai while I was there for the EPOMEC meeting, which is Evolving Practice of Ophthalmology Middle East Conference. That was November of 2023. Check it out. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast. And today I have an interview with an ophthalmologist I met after he sent me a video, Mohammed Sayed who was practicing before in Miami at Baskin Palmer in a private practice, and now is here in Dubai doing the full spectrum of, of anterior segment surgery, but especially cataract and glaucoma surgery. And the video that you sent, which blew me away, was such a common sense idea, which was using a smaller incision to implant the foot plate of a glaucoma seton device. And used a smaller incision because you said, well, if the device is flexible, just fold it in half. It was a clear path. Correct. So tell me, about, tell me about how you got the idea first, and then we'll get into your whole path and your background, but I just thought it was brilliant. Such a simple idea. We'll make a small pyridomy. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Jose, for uh, like having me. Uh, I'm, uh, you know how uh, you know, I follow you avidly. Uh, um, Cataract Coach is uh, my number one entertainment source, <laughs> no. and um, you know I watch every video every day, and I uh, I'm subscribed to the website. I get the emails uh, daily in my inbox, and uh, I want to tell everybody that um, actually the website itself has a lot of features that are not in YouTube by itself. Sure. So make sure that you subscribe to CataractCoach.com um, mailing list, and uh, it's a pleasure having you. Here in Dubai, um, it's uh, I finally met you uh, after so many uh, like back and forth communications, emails, encounters. yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, I'm I'm happy to be here with you. It's it's I'm I'm, I'm honored. 
Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I was really amazed. I get at Cataract Coach, we get 30 to 50 videos sent in a, a week. It's a lot of videos. But that video, the second I saw it, I just thought, gosh, that is a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of that? Right. So, so it's it's an old idea. So some people would, uh, you know, back in the days, they would uh, like cut the wings of the Barville tube, um, and then like you know, um, like um, fold the Barville tube, even though it was not a flexible material. It's mm. much harder to fold. But um, you know, it's not a brand new idea. But um, I have to give credit to uh, uh, India Paul Singh. Uh, who I actually saw a video of his uh, doing this with the clear path. And then, like, everybody does their own little modification. Sure. And uh, I've seen so many modifications of that technique, but I, I have to give credit to Paul Singh. Yeah, we keep evolving the techniques. You start with, like, you see someone operate, and say, you know, that's a great idea, but I'd probably do this little change. And then someone does the same, and, and the techniques keep evolving. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell me about your path in ophthalmology, because it's very interesting because you have a experience obviously in a lot of anterior segment surgery and uh, multiple fellowships, glaucoma and pediatrics. So you can handle some more, I think the toughest glaucoma cases ever are these pediatric ones. So you've got an expertise in all Correct. the above. Correct. So um, my path to ophthalmology, I, uh, you know, I'm a native of Egypt um, and uh, I graduated in medical school in Alexandria. Uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to be an ophthalmologist when, you know, when I, like the first lecture in ophthalmology, I, and I was sold. Nice. And, uh, yeah, I, I like, I, I wouldn't do anything else. And um, I, I, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, uh, wasn't able to secure an ophthalmology residency in um, my hometown. And uh, I, like, you know, traveled for her uh, observerships sure. um, all around Morpheus Hospital in London, Baskin Palmer in Miami. And I was doing an observership in Baskin Palmer, and I meet, um, you know, an ophthalmologist who works in Saudi Arabia. And he tells me there is uh, this program in Saudi Arabia, the residency program in Saudi Arabia, and for the first time they are going to accept a non Saudi applicant. And, um, I mean, residency spots in the U.S. are competitive, but for our American listeners, you might realize outside the U.S., it's far more competitive. It's very competitive. So I remember, like, hundreds of applicants for like you know four or five spots. That's um, you know uh, on par with like the most competitive in the U.S. Sure. And um, so um, I applied uh, to that program and. Uh, I got in, and uh, I worked in Saudi Arabia um, in uh, um, a chain of uh, private eye hospitals alongside my uh, residency training. They sponsored me for it, and uh, after I finished, even though my contract with them was uh, for me to stay on on the staff of the hospital for a number of years before I can uh, go anywhere else, um, Dr. Ala Aldanasori, who was... Uh, uh, one of my heroes. Um, I, I told him, listen, I really want to go uh, to the U.S. to uh, uh, pursue fellowship training. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, go ahead. And uh, I went to Baskin Palmer. I was a research fellow initially in oculoplastics, which I never wanted to do. But, you know, international graduates, like, you know, whatever. Um, you take what you can get. Yeah, yeah. So, but interesting, even when you did the oculoplastics, you're involved with a research study that was related to glaucoma. Correct. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, my my oculoplastics mentor, her name is uh, Wendy Lee, uh, who I love. At Bascom, yeah. At Bascom Palmer. Um, so um, they, she was working um, on a project to, um, you know, see the uh, fat um, atrophy. Uh, atrophy of uh, in patients who are started on prostaglandin analogs, prostaglandin periorbitopathy. So uh, we were recruiting patients from Dr. Richard Lee's clinic, who's mm -hmm. uh, one of the glaucoma faculty in Baskin Palmer, and he's, uh, you know, the the closest mentor to my heart, and um, the one who helped me a lot, and, and still helping me till today. And uh, so I told him. Uh, so she told me, uh, like, you know, Dr. Richard Lee is. Uh, 
you know, he will need you to be on top of things. Like, you know, if he like texts you to come see a patient or like, um, you know, can send them and take pictures or whatever. You go right away. Right yeah. away. So Dr. Richard Lee, every time he would text me, hey, I have a patient who I'm going to start on uh, pressing analogs. And I told him about the study, you know, uh, come consent them. And I would be there in like a minute or two. And uh, I felt that uh, he really appreciated the fact that I was, um, I had a good work ethic. I was on top of it. And um, Sure, because he has a really busy clinic and he just can't have the patient sitting there waiting for a long period of time. He wants it done now. Absolutely, yeah, that, was, sure. that was the case. And um, so I got the patients out of the room right away. And uh, I approached them and I told them, you know what, uh, I really want to do research with you in glaucoma. And um, uh, I ended up doing three years, three more years of uh, research with Dr. Richard Lee. Wow. Probably had a no number of publications then. Yeah, I, I had a very good number of publications in my first year. I think we published eight or something, and like you know, every year wow, we would busy. publish seven or eight. For sure. And um, you know, I think that uh, I did a, you know, it, it was uh, some of the best time of my life. Like learning from uh, uh, Richard Lee on the professional side, on the on, uh, personally as well, work ethic. Um, I can't. I can't. Uh, express uh, enough how grateful I am to him. And then, um, you know, he knew that I wanted to do a glaucoma fellowship. So more clinical than less research. Yes, yes. So I, I was doing like, you know, I, I was four years, um, you know, a research fellow for four years, like, you know, with, with no surgery and like, you know, I felt my hands Your hands were, get rusty. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it, it was very difficult at the time to get into the Glaucoma Fellowship at Baskin Palmer. It's a very competitive Oh, it's one program. of the very best in the whole U.S. Yeah, it's uh, considered like, you know, one of the top two. It's always like, you know, they talk about Duke, Baskin Palmer, like, sure. you know, as the top Glaucoma Fellowships amongst like, you know, many other great programs. Uh, but it, it, it was not easy. And um, it, so one of uh, Dr. Lee's ideas was to... Um, you know, for me to like do something related to glaucoma, maybe pediatric glaucoma. And uh, sure. Um, so I applied for a pediatric ophthalmology fellowship and I got accepted. But during my pediatric ophthalmology fellowship, rather than focusing solely on strabismus, I uh, worked with uh, Peter Chang, who is another hero of mine. Um, Over ped glaucoma. Yes. Right. So Peter is also dual trained pediatric ophthalmology and glaucoma even though he trained in glaucoma first. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, he was doing the most complex, uh, he, he gets referrals from all around uh, the world, basically for his expertise in um, pediatric anterior segment surgery and pediatric glaucoma. I learned so much from him. Then, um, you know, the following year, I applied again to uh, the clinical glaucoma fellowships, but this time I had, you know, some um, data clinical sure. you know, work backing me up, and uh, with the support of uh, Peter and Richard, I got in uh, the uh, Baskin Palmer Glaucoma Fellowship as one of the four fellows, and this was an amazing year. Uh, I learned so much, Sure. but I learned as much in my first uh, year or two in, uh, on my own. Yeah, that's, that's ultimately the acid test, is that, you know, it's amazing to have great training and great mentors and people right next to you in the operating theater, operating room. But when you get there on your own, and your own clinic, and there's no one to your left, no one to your right, it's all on your shoulders. Yeah, you... You, you learn by doing. You get in trouble, and then you look around, you figure out you're the most senior person <laughs> in the OR. And right. you have to deal with it. Yeah, so... Uh, I mean, there's, we always say on cataract, there's a lot more learning. In the first couple years in practice, You'll learn more than you did in the previous 10 years. And let me tell you, so if anybody asks me who taught you cataract surgery, I tell them Oday Divgan. And initially, <laughs> initially they think that I actually, you actually taught me like, you know, in person and they get very impressed. Oh, really? And how? Like, was he in Miami or did you go to LA? Yeah. And I said, no, it's like just the internet, but it's just, I never missed a video. And every time I'm doing a case, I'm remembering something that O'Day had said. Yeah. Pivot in the incision. Uh, viscoelastic cheaper than vitreous. <laughs> Don't make a baby rexus. Right, yeah, um, yeah. You know, get the nucleus out. Uh, so, like, so many things that, um, you know, your teachings have been invaluable. 
not to a small number of residents every year, but to thousands of right. like ophthalmologists around the world. And I think that this, uh, you know, like the, you changed the uh, face of cataract surgery learning oh, around the world. You. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest here yeah. and very genuinely, I think, um, you know, that uh, after cataract coach, uh, cataract surgery training is no longer the same. It's oh, thank you. Yeah, we continue to learn from each other. I mean, I just came last weekend from a meeting in, in Hyderabad, India, where there were some amazing presentations on MSICS, so manual small incision cataract surgery. And I learned things in that meeting that are going to refine my technique of this procedure. So I think that's the neat part is that, you know, we keep learning and we keep evolving. And obviously the way you and I are going to do surgery 10 years from now, it's not what we're doing now. It's, so we've got to keep evolving, got to keep learning. That's that's very true. That's very true. I was uh, we have a, a like you know a, a, a text group for my co fellows and I, sure. and uh, we keep sending like you know cases and videos and ask each other about like you know the you know the cases that mm -hmm. we do, and even though we had the exact same rotations, we were trained by the exact same attendings. Right. Every one of us is doing something completely different from the other person, yeah. and all of us are doing something that we had never learned in fellowship. Right. So, and and we we didn't graduate like you know that long ago. It's five six years ago. So. Right. I mean, extrapolate a little bit more. I'm obviously older. You know, when I finished my residency in 2000, none of these things existed. There was no lamellar coronal transplantation. There was no OCT machine. There was no anti-VEGF compounds. There was no MIGs. The, there, there was no EDO off lenses. None of these things even existed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've got to learn and keep learning as you go. And, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, the beauty, too, is I've got to give credit to Bob Osher, the godfather of surgical videos, who when I used to you know, borrow his VHS tapes when I was a resident in the late 1990s. But by watching it on video, boy, we can compress that learning curve. You know, one of the, the videos I showed when I was in India was about fake wound burns. And... Um, I have had ophthalmology residents send me a video and say, look, I, here's a case where I saw that smoke sign where the phaco tip is clogged, so you give a little bit of energy, it pulverizes the lens material, but it doesn't aspirate it, so it looks like smoke in the AC. Correct. And he knows, hey, he stopped, pulled out of the eye, and the tip was blocked, and he saved that patient. So watching that video of the phaco wound burn, he remembered it, and that two minutes he spent watching that video saved his patient a lifetime of irregular stigmatism. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's really neat that we keep learning from each other. In fact, here at this meeting with this the big EPOMEC meeting, Evolving Practice of Ophthalmology Middle East Conference, which is going to be in the next couple of days, all my talks are purely video. Right. I don't have a single PowerPoint slide. Yeah, and, and this brings us to the importance of actually record, recording every case. Even, oh, for sure. Even if you don't feel comfortable showing it to the world. Yeah. But recording every case and studying your own surgical videos and like you, you, you always say, being your own, you know, toughest critic. Right. Um, you know, like, will we'll, we'll make you learn much quicker than you, you would if you, yeah. do, if you don't record your cases and watch them. I make sure that I record every single case that I do. Right. And yeah, you may not save that recording if it's a routine case, but yeah, and important to be your own toughest critic. There's a funny joke that I heard that I just relate to it so well. The joke is someone tells you, okay, we'll give you $50, but the person you hate the most gets 100 Are you game for that? And the answer is, of course, why wouldn't I want $150? <laughs> because sometimes I just hate myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I think I learned a lot from my mistakes. I learned a lot from you commenting on sure. my mistakes, uh, even though you're like always, uh, you, you, you know, you, you say it in a way that like, OK, oh, you did a great job, but like you should have done this um, here. You should have done this there. Uh, but uh, and I feel like, you know, sharing complications is not really like we all get complications. If we don't share our complications, sure. how are people going to learn how to avoid them? Right. Well, how are we going to learn? I showed a case at uh, one of my meetings where, I, you know, loose zonules, I put the viscoelastic, then I put the CTR in, and then some of the cortex of stuff is stuck in place because of the CTR. And one of the people who's discussing the case to me, she says, well, you should just, when you put the viscoelastic, why don't you visco-dissect off the cortex? I'm like, 
yeah, why didn't I do that? That yeah. would have made so much more sense. Right. So the little things to have other people help kind of critique it and give you advice, nah, it makes us all better. And complications happen. Just I was, we're showing you a case today earlier that I published on Cataculture, video 1990, so about three, four weeks ago, where I'm just doing cortex removal on that round, smooth, silicon plastic IA tip, the polymer tip. The capsule pops open, and I don't know why. But then how to recover from that? So like you said, we all get complications. The only surgeons who don't get complications and are those who... who don't operate. <laughs> or they or lie about it. Or not fully truthful, right. <laughs> and so we all get complications, but to be able to like recover like that case, as soon as it happened, yeah, I was a little shocked, but hey, I knew what to do. And by some, by some stroke of good luck and good, good practice, anterior hyaluronic phase stayed intact, no vitreous prolapse, very securely placed sulcus lens with optic capture, patient had a beautiful outcome. And never needs a YAG laser capsulotomy now. Awesome, yeah, yeah. So um, I learned so much from Cataract Coach, uh, from your own videos, of course, and like your teachings, but also from like, you know, all the, the things, like, you know, the residents. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, for years you have published uh, videos of residents, anonymous residents sure. that, um, you know, were operating, kind of struggling with steps and um, how you kind of instructed them to like, you know, get out of trouble or stay out of trouble and like, you know, finish mm -hmm. the case beautifully. Um, you know, those were like invaluable. Like um, in every case, I, every case that I do until yesterday I was operating, um, every case that I do, I remember an advice of yours that I watched or heard on Cataract Coach and I apply it and it saves me from getting in trouble. Yeah, it's, it, the resident cases, even if you're in practice, are so helpful to learn from. Today's video is a resident's first anterior vitrectomy. Correct. And popping the capsule open and then the manager... Struggling with the, the viscoelastic. With the viscoelastic yep. Right, I mean, because the, the trick is you gotta inject the viscoelastic but then at some point you got to take your foot off the infusion, otherwise you're just pushing all the, the viscoelastic back out of the eye. Right. And this poor resident, he or she ends up going through multiple tubes of viscoelastic before that kind of sets in. But it's like learning this now will shorten your learning curve. Absolutely. When you see it, you know how to deal with it. Right. It rings a bell. Hey, I've seen this before. Right. Yeah. I agree with that. So you finished, you finished, you, wow, so you did a research fellowship in plastics, research fellowship in glaucoma, clinical fellowship in PEDS, clinical fellowship in, in uh, well, glaucoma as well. And then what'd you do? Then I joined Baskin Palmer as a faculty member. Uh, I was uh, uh, four days a week in uh, a satellite in Naples, which is like two hours, a two hour drive from Miami. And Naples is far. So, so Miami's on the east coast of Florida, Naples already on the west coast of Absol Florida. Yeah. You gotta cross the whole state. Right, so I rented an apartment and I remember uh, in Naples, uh, my wife and my son, my, he was just newly born, like, um, you know, they had to live in Miami because my wife was uh, a starting gastroenterology resident, uh, fellow, gastroenterology fellow. And uh, I rented an apartment in Naples, but I was so attached to my newborn that, of course. Uh, you know, I was like, okay, I'm not going to miss a night with my son. I'm gonna have to drive back and forth from Miami to Naples and then back every day. That's like four hours of driving or more. That's four hours of driving or more. That's like almost five hours or like four hours 45 um, every single day. And uh, uh, I got so burnt out. I bet. And uh, you know, I really wanted to move to Miami. Um, I couldn't move to uh, the Bascom Palmer main site, and uh, I decided to join private practice. Initially, I joined a uh, private equity-owned practice, mm -hmm. and uh, in that private equity-owned practice, uh, you know, there are several models, um, and there are several practices that are owned by the same sure. private equity group. I was working the most in um, an HMO, um, you know, practice in an underserved part of Miami and uh, you know it, it it was the best training that I had because it was the toughest cases it was all the cases that were neglected or like you know immigrants that had no health care for decades and then like you know so really advanced disease 
really advanced disease, black cataracts, uh, terrible glaucoma that doesn't respond to anything, um, you know, cases of combined cataracts and glaucoma, like, like the corneas are very, like, you know, opaque and scarred. Um, Lusanules, neovascular glaucoma, all with cataracts and terrible diabetic retinopathy, cataracts with vitreous hemorrhage in the back, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so, so a great opportunity to not only help countless patients who are desperate for care, but boy, it challenged your skills to the max. Absolutely. So I think that I, you know, I was never um, confident in my skill as much as I was after finishing a year working in that place because I, I really did some of the toughest cases. Right. You know, um, and and after that, like you know, my confidence level just. You know, I, I don't want it to go up to a level where, you know, like it's dangerous. But, you know, I think that uh, at that point, I, would, I, I never turned away a patient. Right. And uh, Yeah, we talk, we're talking about the learning curve. And so you get to the point where, like, you're actively seeking out the challenging ones, I'll take them. Right. The really tough case, I'll take it. Correct. And, right. and until now, like, you know, I, I kind of find enjoyment in, in right. uh, doing the tougher cases. Uh, but that year kind of like, you know, really polished uh, my skill to a great degree. And I, I, I'm, I'm, even though it's, it, it was not an environment that I really wanted to, like, you know, spend the rest of my career in. Sure. But uh, I'm really grateful that I ended up doing that year because uh, it, it really made a difference in my skill level. Um, after that, uh, you know, my wife had finished her fellowship and we uh, decided to move to an area north of Miami called Vero Beach. I joined a great private practice and uh, I was doing the full range of things. It was the most efficient private practice I have seen. We were doing, um, like I was doing like 30 plus cases, like, you know, finishing by 3 p.m. Like with like five, six like glaucoma tubes, like, you know, 20 cataracts, uh, 25, and like, you know, with a bunch of MIGs, of lenses, probably, yeah. MIGs, and, uh, you know, like combined and like, you know, so many of these, like all premium lenses and stuff. So uh, I, you know, like, you know, kind of like the big volume of cases um, in, in those two years working in that practice. Then, um, you know, we are originally from Egypt, and uh, I wanted to. Um, give my son uh, um, an Arabian flavor, if you want to say. Sure. And um, I felt that uh, I also wanted to give back to, like, you know, to the, to, to the Middle East, where I originally come from. Sure. The big need. There is a big need. And um, I, I feel that the service that uh, we provide is, is uh, invaluable because there are a lot of people who would otherwise need to travel internationally to, to find a fellowship trained ophthalmologist. Sure. So, um, you know, my, my colleagues and I in uh, Moorfields, Dubai, um, you know, I think that uh, we do a great community service. And, uh, you know, reason being we're all fellowship trained, Western fellowship trained, and, uh, you know, bring to the area some expertise that uh, is much needed. And, and while you're here in Dubai, you have patients from basically many other countries coming in to see you. Absolutely. So there are other, like, you know, Gulf countries, um, you know, like they, they, they don't have, like, you know, the, you know, ophthalmologists who have the subspecialist expertise. They send all their cases to us. Uh, in addition, you know, like Dubai is a, is a hub for medical tourism. Sure. So we get a lot of patients from, um, Africa from uh, from Asia um, and the uh, locals and the expats who live in Dubai as well um, and the larger United Arab Emirates um, so I think that uh, you know we, we I still do very complex cases mm -hmm. um, you know cases that are referred from uh, outside the country or from within um, you know, I think that uh, we, we also have an obligation towards the uh, ophthalmic fraternity in, in uh, the UAE. We, um, you know, often help hold courses to, to teach them, like, you know, uh, what we know and the, the, the newest, you sure. know, techniques and devices in the market and medications and things. So I think that, uh, you know, I'm really uh, happy at this point with the, with the service that uh, I'm providing. And it gives a great sense of fulfillment. 
it's interesting. You kind of had to go through all those steps so to build up that expertise and then go into practice in Miami where you were super busy and, and learned in those underserved communities. And that just all kind of honed your skills to the point where like, yeah, now here in Dubai, you can do like incredibly challenging cases. I mean, I've seen some of your videos that are just, wow, those are, I look at that video and I think, that surgery would take like a week or two off my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is stressful. Yeah, and, 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 and <laughs> patients don't realize that, by the way. Oh. Many of them don't. Like, you know, that, that it, it actually takes a... The stress, a, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it can get very stressful. But I learned from you as well on how to manage, you know, your stress level. <sighs> during surgery. Yeah, stay calm, absolutely. Stay calm. I did actually... Um, you know, measure my, my pulse. The heart rate monitor, the, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I stay calm. I stay calm. I learned that from you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I publish all these things because these are the things I learned the hard way. Right. And I had great mentors, too. We all, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. We all learn from each other. We always have great mentors. But yeah, ultimately, you just take some time to settle in. Like, okay, the best is to stay calm. Or the case I talked about earlier where I'm doing cortex removal and capsule breaks. Just... No issue at all. Immediately go from vacuum down to position one just for irrigation. Get the viscoelastic. She hands it over. Start to inject the viscoelastic. Go to position zero. Inject more and more. And then come out of the eye and, yeah, recover the case. But early in my career, I would have panicked. I wouldn't have been the same. Back when I had no gray hair, it would have been a different story. And so, yeah, you kind of learn as we get, you know, go further and further. And also, the other one we talked about today earlier was about, gosh, the ability to compartmentalize. When I, yeah, when I was younger, I mean, stresses at home or personal life or whatever other nonsense stresses you have in your life, those would end up affecting, at least to a small degree, my surgeries or my surgery day. As I'm doing surgery, I'm, a lot of things going through my mind. But now I'm so good that, like, literally no matter what else is happening, when I'm in the operating room, it's just me and this patient and this surgery, and that's it. Everything else is compartmentalized. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh... Uh, you know, it's it's always very useful when, like, you hear a mentor talking about these things because it, we learn so much more than just surgery or medicine. Sure. We learn how to cope with stress. We learn how to, mm -hmm. like, you know, compartmentalize and separate our, like, you know, personal lives from, like, what we do. We learn how to talk with patients. Earlier today we were talking about, like, you know, good lines. <laughs> Um, you know, that we use with patients sometimes and like, you know, th that are very genuine, but right. like, you know, that we learn from our mentors. So, yeah, right. Okay. Do you mind sharing a couple? Oh, there are, there are a lot of fun ones. I mean, first, I mean, explain to any patient things that you find obvious, which is, well, the result of your surgery is kind of equal parts of my surgery, my technique, my technology, and your tissue, your anatomy, and your healing. I need them both. Right. And when you come there and you've got that patient who's 96 years old with really terrible tissues and bad protoplasm and weak anatomy and limited healing response, and you're thinking you're going to have a great outcome, it really doesn't matter what your surgery is. Absolutely. So with patients, they kind of have to understand that. The other one, too, is patients are always saying, you know, they compare the one eye to the other eye. First, when they do this back and forth, I say, stop, don't do that. That prevents the brain from syncing the images. You don't want to do that. And it, there's validation there. Yeah. And then also, your eyes are sisters, not identical twins. That's <laughs> a great one. Yeah, I love that one. That's a great one. So these are all kind of, I mean, we learn other things, but along the way, but it's an easy way of explaining it to patients. That they get, yeah, my eyes are sisters, not identical twins. I mean, you've seen it with the lens calcs, right? We know IOLs come in half after steps. And you see, you look at the two calcs of the eyes, and one eye, you put in this, the, the, same, the same power lens, it, it calcs out to perfect plane or emetropia. And then the other eye calcs out to, okay, minus a quarter. Well, you can kind of tell the difference. I heard the bad one, though, if you don't mind. Oh, tell me, tell it. me. So now we have removed the cataract in your lens. Now we need to go back to remove the cataract behind the lens. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it, it's important for patients to understand all these things. And I think you know, even when you have a patient with a complicated issue and slow healing or a complication, as long as the patient understands that whatever it takes, I'm here to help you. And so I understand this isn't the outcome we wanted, whatever the issue there is. Let's work together and make this happen. Here's what we can do. So as long as the patient knows and they feel in their heart that you're going to be by their side and not abandon them, 
they'll go along with whatever you need because they know you have their best interests at heart. Absolutely. So the, yeah, all, all little lessons we learn along the way. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when you do our training, we're so concerned with like the surgical part of the this, the technique part. And, but a lot of it actually is just the patient interaction part, which actually, which actually takes, some, that's what takes some time to develop. So let me ask you, Oday, sure. the, what did you learn from teaching residents? Like, you know, there like how many residents were there in the UCLA program every year? So I did it for 22 years, and there were usually eight a year. Eight a year. So, like, you, like, taught eight residents a year how to do cataract surgery right. for 22 years. Right. In person, apart from the thousands that uh, you teach online. But what did this teach you? How you know, do you reflect on that? It told me a lot of things. First, that you know, we all come with different personalities, different abilities, and the, probably the most important thing is how hungry are you? How badly do you want it? How hard are you going to work? An example I give is anyone can learn to throw 10 basketball free throws in a row. And if I say, okay, I'll give you a million dollars, you've got to sink 10 basketball free throws in a row. I'm not that good at basketball, I, but I would practice every night for months, and I will be able to do it. Someone who comes with, there with more athletic or better skills right off the bat could probably practice for a week and do it. But the catch is we both can achieve it. You know what? The same goes for surgery. There are some residents, you see them operating like, wow, you're, you're just a natural. It's just almost no effort, and you're just so good at certain things. And you see other residents who struggle more. But I assure you, at the end, they can all achieve the same metrics or milestones if they put in the work that's required for them. And so we have to get the, out of the thinking of like, well, I, you said I had to you know, go practice for three hours in the wet lab. I did it. Well, that wasn't the point. It wasn't three hours. I want you to be able to throw 10 sutures of 10 or nylon in 10 minutes. 10, 10, 10. And if that takes you... Three hours to learn, great. If it takes you 30 hours, great. If it takes you 300 hours, great. But you got to learn. Because you know what, today, um, Like, you know, I'm, I'm uh, on all these Facebook uh, groups for young ophthalmologists in the mm. Middle East. And there is this, like, you know, very common theme. Um, you know, I, like, you know, my cataract surgery is terrible. Like, you know, I'm getting complications. I think I should do a non-surgical subspecialty. I should do medical retina. I should do whatever. And, and it's just... Yes, it can, it can be the case for, like, you know, an occasional person. But, you know, there is a trend. I'm, like, reading this way more often than I expected. You know, do you think that these people, just these, like, young guys, the young residents, uh, need more guidance and kind of, like, you know, so that they persist and try more and, like, you know, do, like, you know, better technique and, like, you know, in order for them to, to, to find the surgeon within them or, like, you know, just give up? Well, I think the most important question is look in the mirror and say, what do I want? If you could achieve it, would you want to be an anterior segment surgeon or whatever type of surgeon? Would you want to do this? Yes, for sure. Well, then there's already your answer. So you know where you have to go. You have to become this surgeon. But it's just not easy. The path is hard. No one's born knowing microsurgery. My, my first FACO took me an hour. No one's born to know how to throw in a 10-hour mm -hmm. nylon. Nope, not at all. But you know what? Practice makes a heck of a difference. It makes a huge difference. And then doing it both hands. And this hand forward, yep. and, this hand, and this hand back, hand back. Can you do it? And despite all the surgical simulators, we've seen amazing ones. We've used the IC simulator at UCLA for more than a decade. In India last week, I saw this uh, simulator from Help Me See. Help Me See is an organization that was founded by, or was funded by, a billionaire who invented flight simulators. Really? Okay. Yeah. And then now there's a surgical simulator, which I tried, which has real-time feedback, and it's 3D. It, it looks amazing. And that's a fantastic simulator. But you know what? Still nothing beats. Ten on nylon, under a microscope, in the wet lab, suturing a grape, a tomato, whatever. Very easy. 
right? Cost of entry is very low. You can even buy one of these tabletop microscopes on Amazon for 100 US dollars. And obviously you, can have, you have the tenor nylon, you have the, the suture set, and the grapes, I'm sure you can find the grape or tomato. So you don't need a quarter million dollar surgical simulator when you have this. And you think, well, that's not cataract surgery, but more importantly, it teaches you to use your hand under scope. Yeah. And by the way, if you want the extra credit question, once you can do the 10, 10, 10, 10 sutures of tenor nylon in 10 minutes, the next question is, of the standard tenor nylon, how many sutures can you throw with the one suture material? How many knots? Now, this is a combination of how much suture do you waste per throw? Do you handle the needle with respect so you don't dull it? And then that, I won't give you the answer to that one. You've got to tell me. <laughs> challenge, challenge thrown out there. Let's see who accepts. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, and, so, so I, my advice is for the young people, don't give up. Right. Don't give up. If some of you, you, you've come this far in your career, in your life. It's not been easy. When you were in high school, everyone was competing. You ended up at the top of the class. Same for your college, same for your medical school. You got one of the coveted ophthalmology residency spots. You can do it. You have to do it if it's what you want. And my advice is don't give up. Just work harder. And again, think about me and throwing basketball free throws. I'm not that good. It may take me a month. But I promise you, I will win. I will sink the 10 in a row. So you have to have that same drive and determination that you will do this. And honestly, in my life, I promise I'm not that smart. I really am not. But I'm really hardworking. And I think that ultimately is far more important. And so if you, how many people do you know you could tell them, I want you to make a five minute edited video every day for 2,000 days in a row. Who's, who, no, who's dumb enough? Everybody's gonna give up after a week or two. Well, you know what, here you go. I did, already hit 2,000. And so again, again, it's all about the hard work. Five years. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah basically we're in our sixth year already. So it's all about hard, hard work and you can do it. So don't give up, no, especially the young people who are learning. And I know that training programs aren't the same. Sometimes we're lucky, like I, you know, I had a great residency training program in the U.S. But you may say, well, I'm not in the U.S., I'm in this country, and I don't have such great training, and I don't have all these men. I understand. Maximize your opportunity for what you do have, and then seek ways of improving yourself. And always remember, even today, what I do, I didn't learn residency. I learned on my own afterwards. Absolutely. So, yeah, don't give up. No way. Have that faith. You can do it. Email me. I'll give you advice. Yeah, those uh, <laughs> words of wisdom from uh, O'Day are invaluable. And uh, I, I can, um, you know, testify to that personally. And, um, you know, O'Day is, is, a, is a hero of mine. And I really think that, uh, you know, what I learned from him um, in the operating room watching his videos um, is... is only part of what you can learn from him as a as a person and as a a, a life mentor and uh, you know thank you so much for, oh, for you're making doing me this blush amazing work <laughs> like for all of us yeah. for thousands of us out there uh, it did uh, change the way we practice it did the the change the way we look at things at work and at life at the same time yeah you know honestly it may be it made me a better surgeon as you know now probably half or even slightly more than half the videos I feature are from other surgeons. And I learned so much. I've got a video coming up from a surgeon in Thailand who has such an innovative way of doing like a um, scleral fixation with proline, but without doing those burnt flange ends. Okay. It sounds to me, it's, it's coming in December, coming next month. All right. So I've had this podcast air somewhere in December. The video should be out there, but it's... So, I mean, I learn, again, every week by the videos that are submitted to me. And if you send me a video, especially if you follow the directions, on cataractcoach.com there's a link that says submit your video. If you follow those directions, I promise I will watch your entire video. I watch every video that's sent to me. Maybe, let me fast forward through some of them, but I learn a ton. And there are some amazing surgeons out there. And the nice part is, is like the ophthalmology is such a collegial you know, group of people that we, we share all the time. And now the nice part is too, you know, think about it. The surgeries we share are so easy to share because they're brief, they're through a microscope, so it's easy to record. I mean, if I was doing like abdominal surgery, maybe not so much. 
or orthopedic or something else. It's just, but microscope surgeries are easy. You know, Day, what yeah. uh, my wife tells me. My wife tells me, okay, I come from work and want to completely forget about, you know, like dissociate. Sure. Right? But you come from work and you watch Cataract Coach. <laughs> how, how did you manage to make people enjoy this as a leisure activity? Uh-huh. I personally do. I think, I think we do too. I do too. So a lot of people do. But even if, you, if it's your thing, you want to watch it as a leisure thing, great. If not, I'm telling you, the investment though. My idea was that five minutes a day will make you a much better surgeon over the course of a year. Correct. Because there's just so many good little pros. You know, like we're talking about today's video. Wait till you see tomorrow's, another one. So just such great material that we can all learn from and become better surgeons because I think that's our passion. We're such a small group of people. The number of ophthalmologists on the planet is such a tiny percent. I mean, we're probably less than 1% of all physicians in general. So we're such a rare breed as it is. And we operate on the most precious sense sight, probably among the world's biggest problems is blindness, as we know, especially cataract-related blindness. And as with an aging population, is what we're gonna do more and more and more. Absolutely. So, and I don't know how it is in the, in the rest of the world, but in the US, I don't think we're training enough ophthalmologists to meet the demand or to even replace the ophthalmologists who are gonna retire. U.S. is still fixed at about 460 residency spots per year for the entire country of about 360, 370 million people, which is a pretty small number. And then a lot of ophthalmologists who then are in practice, you know, have a work-life balance, maybe don't work, you know, 60 hours a week anymore, maybe they're working 30 hours a week or even less. And so, and then the number of people who are tiring is increasing, so, and then our population, certainly in the U.S. is, is increasing. Aging. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it used to be a rarity 20 years ago to see patients, oh, you got a cataract patient who's 80 something? And today, like, yeah, they're all 80. Yeah, I remember uh, right before I left the US, uh, I looked at, uh, like, you know, my clinic roster, and uh, like there was a column for age. Mm. And there were like 94, 93, 92, 87, 94, <laughs> 93. So all 85 plus. Right. Yeah. And then obviously, these certain diseases whether it's glaucoma or macular degeneration, or obviously cataract, increase with age dramatically. Absolutely. I mean, the percent of people who are 90 years old and have, have glaucoma versus the patients who are, percent of patients who are 60 years old, it's gotta be at least 10X. And so we've, yeah, we've gotta get better and better at this. And uh, no, I think, it's, I think it's an important thing to make that investment. So yeah, going back to the original thing we were talking about for the young ophthalmologists who are questioning themselves, no, if this is something you wanna do, you can do it. You just have to be tenacious. You can't give up. Absolutely, I agree. Completely agree. So what's next for you? So obviously I like your setup here in Dubai. You're working really hard and, and doing this. I'm gonna see you at the Epomec meeting. We've got some fun cases together. We got a good panel. Yeah, yeah. I think it's gonna be a very fun meeting. I think uh, we are together on a, like, you know, uh, you know, a complication um, session. I'm gonna, like, talk about one of my complications and see uh, what you think, what, what, I, what I could have done better to avoid it or to manage it. Yep. And uh, I think uh, we, have, we have some amazing uh, members on the panel, like uh, Mel Yugen, Boris Mel Yugen, uh, sure. Amara Garwal. Um, so it's going to be very fun. Yeah, in my case, that I'm showing a case where uh, I just should I would have now done things totally differently, but I had a complication, took the patient back to the operating room, just became a very challenging case. And I learned a lot from it. And I want to share that with the audience so you can say, okay, here is me doing something that you know, I regretted. It was a wrong decision. Here's what happened, but here's how we recovered. I right. think important to remember, everyone's going to, everyone's going to drop the ball. Everyone's going to foul the ball at some point, but you got to be able to recover. Yeah, like the, the case that I told you about, um, you know, the, uh, it was a very stressful, very, very tough case. And uh, the patient ended up seeing 2020 after a lot of acrobatics yeah. and uh, you know a lot of work in the eye, and the other eye went on eventfully. Routine case. Routine case, completely <laughs> routine. And the patient tells me, "Well, both eyes are great, but you know, if only this eye is like you know the first one, I would be very happy." So the patient wants the uncomplicated the, eye to yeah. have the same visual results as the very complicated eye. Correct. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, sometimes it works out like that. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Very ironic. 
Yeah. But, but yeah, we're going to have a great time at this meeting coming up. I want to, if you're obviously um, thinking about this meeting in the future, I'm going to try to come back to this meeting again. I think it's going to be a fantastic time and a great learning opportunity. Please, if you see me at the meeting, come take a picture with me. I would love a selfie. Uh, yeah, let's take a selfie so we don't take one yet. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll, we'll manage that too. But again, love your videos. Please submit me another one, especially any of these glaucoma ones. I need to have more of the glaucoma stuff on Cataract Coach. And yeah, again, I'm still in awe about one. The first time I saw you just fold the foot plate of the clear path in half and then put it through a small key, you know, keyhole, two, three millimeter opening. Like, wow. Yeah. I never even thought of that. Well, thank so. you, thank you. Yeah, I, I was like really in disbelief when you saw the video um, on my like Facebook wall, and yeah. you, you said, "Just send it to me as is. Don't <laughs> change anything. Just send this video to me." Right. That was uh, yeah, very. Well, flattered. like you, I'm actively watching videos. So in my free time, I'll watch videos, whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube or here or anywhere else. I'm like. Oh, I like that. I need to have that on Cataract Coach. And I'll reach out and say, hey, would you please send me that video? I'd love to have it. Right, right. Because that's how we, you know, got to gather it all together and learn. Absolutely. But fantastic. Well, thank you so much for doing this thank podcast. Thank you so much, Jose, for this having is, I think me. it's going to be so, very valuable honor. for a lot of people to, to listen to and enjoy it. And for people who have a long commute like you used to, <laughs> podcast in the car are a saver. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If I had you know, cataract coach at the time, like a <laughs> podcast, you know, the, the drive would yeah. have been easier from Miami to Naples. Oh, awesome. Well, to remind our listeners here and our viewers, remember, we've got a new podcast every single week. It's on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, anywhere you find your podcast. Plus, it's on YouTube, plus on cataractcoach.com. And also, like Mohammed said earlier, check out the website, cataractcoach.com. We have a full teaching curriculum. If you are struggling to learn cataract surgery, 25-part video curriculum, Start at lesson one. Do a video a week. Let it digest. Six months later, you'll be a better surgeon, I promise. Plus the free Cataract Coach PDF book and all the other good stuff. All right, guys. Until next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for enjoying that podcast with me. I trust you learned a lot and got some good motivation for you to achieve your maximum potential, too. Be a big dreamer and just back it up with hard work, drive, and determination, and you will achieve. Remember, we have a new podcast coming every week with big things that are coming in store. We are doing a lot more international guests. Next week, we're going to have an ophthalmologist from Brazil who's really doing something very innovative to help you become a better surgeon. And in the new year, we're offering even more podcasts with even more great guests. I think you'll enjoy.